Welcome everyone. Uh, Tech and communication, we are live on YouTube, so we are ready to start. I think we are going to wait till five past five to start to just let people join.
Welcome everyone. Uh, I think we're going to start since quite some people joined. Um, so first of all, like we can introduce myself. I'm Simone from Italy, but I'm studying here in Göttingen and I'm part of the lo IPSA local committee in Göttingen. IPSA is the International Forestry Student Association. So it's this network of students, which is active both local and international level. And so we, with the pandemic and everything, we started to think about doing some webinars to really have a way to share knowledge about between students, because we feel like learning is a core aspect of IPSA besides networking. And so every university has its own speciality, something that's really going well. And so we started to organize these kind of activities. We already organized a webinar a few months ago as LC Göttingen that was about uh, flux measurement and drought. And now we are going to start um, this webinar on modeling and how modeling can apply to forestry, which personally I find really interesting. I mean, that's why I end up, end up studying in the master, but I think it's, it can be really nice to see how this tool can be applied in the forest sector. So really looking for it. And so we have the speaker today, which is Katrin Meyer. She's a senior lecturer at the University of Göttingen and active in this ecological modeling field. But I think I, I'm not, um, I mean, I think you can introduce yourself better after it. And so, okay, this is all for my quick introduction. And I will give the word to Katrin and looking forward for the webinar. Many thanks, Simona. That's really nice um, being here. And uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to, um, to the IFSA um, to have the opportunity to speak here to, to you and talk with you about um, virtual forests. Yeah, maybe a bit about um, my background since you said um, uh, you wanted me to introduce myself. So um, I'm actually originally a biologist by training and then specialized very quickly into theoretical ecology and ecological modeling developing simulation models on ecosystems. And I think about 10 years or 11 years, 10, 10 11 years ago, um, I came to Göttingen and then uh, from, from a normal lecture and postdoc moved um, towards the senior lecture, uh, lectureship I have now here in the group of ecosystem modeling. And this is also um, the group from where I get the examples that I want to present to you today. Um, to give you an insight or some overview, brief overview of how to use models for understanding forest ecosystems. Yeah, so these are not the most recent papers or studies that we have in our group, but I thought it's more helpful for this um, talk to just um, pick the examples that work best to illustrate um, how actual um, ecological modeling works in, in reality. And um, some of the material in this talk is based on a talk by Kerstin Wiegand, who's the head of our group, of the ecosystem modeling group in Göttingen. And so that's why I mentioned, or, or that's why we are co-authors here. So um, let's start um, with, uh, let's start here, um, not with the virtual forests, but with the forests. Yeah, because I think there probably many of you are much more an expert than me, who's only here at the forestry department for 10 years now. And um, forests, as you hopefully, or I guess you will uh, agree, are very complex systems in many different ways. And I think I'll start uh, using the chat um, to ask you um, for factors that come to your mind that make forests complex. So which factors or characteristics of forests um, do you know um, that, that matter if you want to study uh, forests as uh, systems? What makes them complex? So what, which factors um, affect your study of forests? Just um, type something into the chat, um, would be great if you interact. It. Yeah, I see microclimate, species composition. Yeah, is there more? Ah, vertical structure, great, yeah. Something else? Oh, density, great. Uh, tree density, but maybe also of other plants. Nutrient supply, nutrition supply, exactly. And soil, obviously. No? So that's probably the people from the 
from the practical side um, will, will know that. Plant-animal interactions, yes, of course, they're animals in the forest and they matter. I see you have many, many ideas. And I, I think if I, I mean, you can continue, <laughs> um, continue writing something, but um, I think it, it's, okay, it makes uh, it clear that forests are indeed complex, especially if we want to understand forests, uh, we have to consider all these different factors and much more. Yeah, and so that makes it quite challenging um, to study forests. So now let's come to the virtual forest. Why should we study forests yeah, with models or in the virtual space? And um, yeah, there I first come to the non-virtual space, that, uh, space that's, uh, for example, field observations. Um, of course, you can, um, or, and that's very, very important to uh, study forests um, by field observations. But you might also be all aware, especially if you've done such field observations already, that these have limitations. Yeah. Um, and one is that a typical funding period for a research project, at least here in Germany, is about three years. I don't know, uh, compare that with the maximum age of a tree. I don't know, um, for, for example, beech tree, Fagus sylvatica. Um, what would you, um, do you know how, what, what the uh, typical age is? That's probably more for the Europeans. No, 20, maybe uh, up to 300 years actually, but 120 years, I mean, how many three year funding periods do you need for that? So that clashes somehow. Then um, the problem is also logistics, infrastructure can be challenging for these field observations. It's expensive, it costs something. And usually field observations can only be used to describe the present state of the, of the ecosystem of the forest. Yeah, it's difficult to, to derive predictions from that and maybe also rec um, recommendations for management. So what can you do? Um, you could do experiments. That's probably what you would say. Why don't we do experiments? Um, this is something to also move towards what if scenarios, yeah, not only describing the present state. And I agree, yeah, experiments are really important, but they do have the limitations, of course, too. No, they are usually art, relatively artificial, yeah, because you do some kind of manipulation. There's quite some costs involved, as probably in the picture you see these um, scaffoldings, these towers or so, and they are usually irreversible. So if you want to study, for example, a new plant that's non-native in a certain system that's probably more drought tolerant or so, thinking about climate warming, um, do you really want to introduce that in an experiment uh, to some, some forest ecosystem to test whether it's, it's working out or not? Because then it's there and it might not be able to take it back. Yeah? And so there comes uh, the benefits of models or virtual approaches to um, yeah, studying forest ecosystems. They do have many benefits. Um, they can describe whole systems they may provide an understanding of the mechanisms yeah, of these um, that make up these complex ecosystems. And sometimes you can use them to actually make predictions yeah, into, into the future, not with all models, but this can is, is sometimes possible. And they have, some people say they have fewer logistic limitations. I would rather say they have other logistic limitations because if you've ever tried to make a model to develop your own model, you realize that it can take longer than a typical PhD or so lasts. Um, so it, it can take quite some time and money and no? but usually it's fine to have a computer and some brains and you don't need all the other logistics for that. So it's other limitations. However, they are not perfect either. I, I agree. Yeah. So it's not the real reality that they represent, but um, it's always a virtual reality. Um, however, we can say something again about these what if, no, if, if then scenarios. And we can try that out. Yeah. So actually, uh, we should not pick one of these um, three or probably more approaches but have them all in our tool toolbox and combine these worlds. Um, and that's actually what we do in our department also. We are experts in modeling, but we work together with experts in for experimental approaches and field observations. And sometimes we actually also um, yeah, um, uh, uh, collect our own data, our own field data, 
um, if that's possible in the course of the project. Yeah, and this is actually what I also recommend to do. So work together and find your modeler or find uh, a nice collaborator for the field observation. So now I've been talking about models a bit, uh, but the question is, what is a model actually? And um, there I would like to use the chat again. So what would you say, what makes a good model? What is the characteristic of a good model? What would you say in your view? Yeah, you all know there might be textbook definitions, but um, what would you say is, uh, how should a good model be? In your view. <laughs> okay, nobody dares. Okay, then I, I give you. No, okay, okay, okay. No, it's there. It's there. I'm just. Oh, okay, okay. You dare. Okay. So it should be relevant to reality. It needs to be transparent. Good point, which is not on my slide, but it, please keep that in mind. Um, needs to be, has, needs to have a good representation, it needs to be representative. Um, Needs to be simple, but detailed enough for the research question. Nice. <laughs> but that's unfair. Johanna has, has had a class with, with me. Um, and, uh, and a clearly specified purpose. Thank you. This is, and this is perfect. No? And this is actually um, what my definition, what I actually like to use for models, for scientific models, of course, and what it uh, consists of. And that's a simplified purpose oriented or purposeful representation of reality. Yeah. And so this has two main characteristics, but I would add the transparency and this representativeness um, for sure. Yeah. Um, ah, sorry, this, that's the, the simplification. You always need to simplify. If your model is 100% reality, you don't learn anything. Yeah, so that's why it's not always really the aim to make your model as close to the reality, to the re to your real forest as possible, but um, it's actually better the simpler you can make it because then you learn more. Yeah, um, and you need a purpose. Uh, a purpose can be a question, a model question, to decide where to simplify. So what to keep in the model, which factors, and which to leave out. Yeah, remember the long list from the beginning of all the factors that affect um, yeah, the forest ecosystem or that might make, make some, play some role. Um, so probably you don't need all of them. Uh, and to decide that you need a good and concrete question. So what are purposes of models? I think you might come up with many different ones in, uh, and you can think of some now, um, but there are three different big categories for these purposes, which I want to mention here. And the first one is to describe a system. Yeah, really just go for a description of a system. And there often the, the ultimate aim is to communicate um, some, something by, by simplifying um, the system. Second purpose um, is to understand mechanisms, yeah, which I have mentioned before. And this is probably the one that's most common. I think it, at least in my experience in, that's the most common purpose of models in science. Yeah, so not, not really describing the system, but more common it's, it is to, to wanting to understand what, what are the mechanisms, no? what are the interactions, what, which factors matter. And these can then be used to um, prepare experimental designs for real experiments, yeah? experiments in reality. And the third main category of purposes is um, prediction. So to predict some dynamics of your system. Yeah, and this is really important. Um, I mentioned that also already earlier, but this is really important to understand that not every model is, is fit to do predictions or to be predictive, because for predictive models, you need a lot of information. You need very good data to make a prediction on the point. For example, how will this particular forest look like with climate warming in 10 years or so? Yeah. And for understanding mechanisms for the second purpose here, you might need a bit less information and still get out something meaningful. Mm -hmm. However, if you have a predictive model in the third category, then this can also be used, of course, to support decision, decision making. But okay, to a certain degree, this is also possible with models in the other categories. Yeah, so these are the purposes of models. And here I now <laughs> come to the overview of my talk. And we've already done the first um, point. That's why 
we should uh, go virtual or why some, some people go virtual when they uh, look at forest ecosystems and uh, what is the model. Um, and I want to illustrate that now in the following with three examples. First on dry forests. Um, this will be a bigger example to really walk you through the different steps in modeling. Um, and then two very brief examples, one for the temperate forests and one for tropical forests. So we move up in the biodiversity. Yeah? So increase um, it, biodiversity will be increasing from the first to the third example. And in the end, um, I'll give you some very brief hints or ideas how you can do it yourself if you want to start modeling on your own, even if you have no background in programming or mathematics whatsoever. Okay, first example um, is about dry forests or savannas. And here we are talking um, about an example from the Negev Desert in Israel, where we have um, 2200 millimeters of mean annual precipitation in this area. Uh, so that's really not much. Um, if you know the mean annual precipitation or roughly know it for your place where you are now, or where you come from, um, then you can uh, put that into the chat, maybe the, the number and uh, the place. That would be really interesting, I think, to many of us. Yeah, okay, Gottingen, we have hi to the Gottingen crowd, 716, huh? so that's quite, quite a difference to the desert. Okay, Denmark, very similar to Gottingen, interesting. And in Czechia, 600, a bit less, yeah, so a bit drier. Ah, Philippines. Ah, wow, yeah, 4,000. <laughs> Great. That's tropical. Yeah, we get that. Yeah, great. Um, thanks for that. And if people are looking up uh, that, uh, continue to put that into the chat if you want, yeah. Um, but you see here the 2,200 millimeters is really not much. Yeah, that I, I wanted, I also asked this to put this into perspective. And uh, so as you all know, trees and forests need a lot of water. I mean, this is really a very, not very dense forest. It's, it's more single trees and they only occur in so-called vadis. Um, and these vadis are dry riverbeds. Yeah, and this is what people told me um, about the savannas or about these deserts um, that they are usually dry and the water comes from very deep soil layers. However, when I first traveled uh, to Israel only for a few days, um, <laughs> then, uh, this is how uh, I, I experienced that. So there was actually a lot of water um, because one of these three big rainstorms that um, make up these 100, up to 100 millimeters of mean annual precipitation just happened uh, on, on, the, on, my, on the day um, of uh, arrival. Um, and I also have a a little video here. So this is just uh, just through rainfall, yeah, the water here. That's not no bursting pipe or so. This is just one uh, one rainfall and everything is full of water. And apparently also more people die in the desert from, but you know that maybe from, from drowning than from, um, uh, from the drought. Yeah, so um, trees are mostly in bodies and trees are mostly acacias probably some of you are familiar with acacias. In this region, it's mostly, for those who are interested in the species, Vachelia tortilis subspecies radiana. And the old name, and that's also the name at the time when this was studied, was acacia radiana, but this big discussion has now changed. Um, and this is how it looks like, the main species there. And if we zoom in a bit, then you see it's quite, um, it, it can defend itself, has quite long spikes because it's being browsed by goats and so on. And that's protection against a kind of protection, but the goats get around it. Um, so these acacias are important for animals on the one hand as food, but also as protection and shade, but also for the local human population, the Bedouins. Um, and there they are important for firewood, but for also for fodder for their um, for, for the animals and also for traditional medicinal purposes. Yeah, so they are really um, uh, yeah, important. Um, and, uh, but they do face some problems at, or faced at that time uh, some problems. There were many dead trees and almost no seedlings. Yeah, and they didn't really know what's, what's the mechanism, what's, what's happening there. 
And this is where the virtual forest or the virtual approach um, started. So the question was, um, which factors are important for the survival of the trees in the desert? Yeah, because um, this was just the riddle that they needed solving. So if we recap our model definition from the beginning, we need a simplify and purpose oriented representation of reality. And this is our purpose now. Yeah, so this is the concrete um, question, which factors are important for the survival of the trees in the desert? And now we can start simplifying and, but how, can, how do we do that? Yeah, which, which model components should we consider? Yeah, and so now comes the first step or the first step was actually the question. Now comes the second step. Um, and that's um, how, how do you find out which components you put into your model? And um, what you usually do is do some literature research. I mean, you do that also for other projects, of course. No? You consult experts that can be the Bedouins who live there, but that can also be scientists um, who have published about this yeah, and who haven't, probably have some more knowledge than what they have put into their publications. And um, you may also conduct own field observations. Um, to, and in this case, this was also done. This was a study conducted mainly by Kerstin Wiegand, the head of our group. And um, these all together said that the main model components that which should not be left out, not, not be simplified away is tree height, seed production, and infestation with mistletoe. Yeah, mistletoe is a parasitic plant for those who don't know that. And of course there were other processes in the model like, like germination, survival and so on, but these uh, three ones um, had to be in there. That's what the literature said. So what's the next step? The next modeling steps were to derive rules from field observations and experiments. Yeah, and, um, and these rules are then applied to virtual trees to give us the simulation model. And here I must maybe explain that the approach that um, we mostly take in our department is the so-called so-called agent-based modeling or individual-based modeling, where you have individual, like, like each individual tree, for example, is an object, each individual animal is an object which has some traits or characteristics. And these, um, based on these traits, the individuals interact with each other and with their environment. Yeah, and this is why probably some of you, when you ha heard modeling, or maybe you had some modeling classes already, um, you were thinking about equation-based modeling. That's the classic way to do models. So come up with systems of equations that describe your ecosystem and all the processes and interactions. However, um, sometimes systems are too complex or it's for other reasons important to consider the, the individual traits, the individual characteristics. And then um, you don't operate on the basis of systems of equations, but you can only describe that with rules, yeah? And put these rules then into computer code. Yeah, so you cannot solve that um, based on mathematics anymore. And this is our approach here. This is a rule-based approach and individual or agent-based approach with individual virtual trees. So what could be an example of a modeling rule? In this case, um, an example could be a seedling with a circumference of less than 3.5 centimeters dies with a probability of 60%. Yeah? And then for each seedling in, uh, that uh, is smaller than uh, 3.5 centimeters or less thick than that, um, a random number between zero and 100% is drawn uh, by your computer and always compared with the 60%, if it's smaller then this seedling will die. If um, this random number is larger than 60%, then this um, seedling will survive. Yeah? And this is something you do with all the processes. This is also a way to include some stochasticity into the model, no? because you will never, if, if you have 100 seedlings in your model, it will never be exactly, or very rarely be exactly 60 that die. And it will sometimes be 61 and sometimes 58 or so. Yeah, so you have some demographic stochasticity, which is a bit more realistic than just taking 60%, which you would do in a mathematical equation-based modeling approach. Yeah, so imagine a set of rules, lots of rules, which are then turned into computer code. And this is what Kerstin did already some time ago um, with her spatial acacia model, no? acacia, because that, that was the name at the time. Sam is the name of this model. And we look here now at, at the, from the top onto a landscape 
and the dots are trees. That's our individual trees. We know the XY coordinates of each tree. We know their position in this grid and they interact with um, the landscape um, char characteristics at the place, uh, at the cell in this grid where they are. Yeah, and um, just to show you, give you some idea how an output of this model looks like. Well, you run the model then, it's, it's, I only gave you some, some small examples. It's a bit more complex, of course, but not much more complex. And this would be one typical model output. Um, this is just the uh, size frequency distribution. Yeah. So on the y-axis, you have the frequencies. And at, on the x-axis, the diameters at breast height in centimeters. And you see, for example, that in this case, we have relatively, I, I mean, the, we have a, a lot of um, yeah, uh, smaller diameters at breast heights and uh, the larger ones a bit more rare. And if you now uh, consider the first um, diameter at breast height class as seedlings, this orange one, then the nice thing about such a modeling approach is that you can zoom in, yeah? that you can look into this, these dynamics and have an idea, okay, what's, what's actually happening there with the seedlings and how does this look, for example, over time? Uh, and this is how this looks over time. So here you have on the um, y-axis, the number of trees and you see the, them plotted here over simulation, simulated time and years, yeah, up to 125 years. And if you first look at the blue line or purple blue line, you see that it's, it shows some oscillations, but it's relatively stable. So that's the old ones, yeah, the old older trees. And the orange line, that's the seedlings, and you see all these peaks there, strong oscillations. Yeah? So they show very strong dynamics in the model. So something is happening here. And um, with then the model was analyzed a bit deeper, different um, uh, input factors were like, like or, and also processes were compared with each other. And uh, in the end, if we come back to our original model question, so which factors are important for the survival of trees in the desert? Um, the answer of the model was that germination rate was actually the most important process or factor in the model, no? which makes sense with the results that we saw that seedlings have such uh, strong dynamics here. Yeah, so, and the nice thing about this result is um, first, if I had asked you in the beginning, even people maybe who have experience with um, such dry ecosystems, probably, I mean, it would have probably have been difficult to really pinpoint, okay, it's the germination rate could have been survival of, of, of the older trees or so on. No? So it's not trivial, even though it seems plausible now. And the other um, um, yeah, nice fact about this is that this even turned into um, a management recommendation in this case. Yeah, so even though this whole model falls into the second category of trying to understand the mechanisms, yeah, you remember the second category of purposes, um, we or they were able to um, derive some management recommendations because the germination rate is actually um, affected on the one hand by, by the weather, but on the other hand by animals. Yeah, so whenever one of these acacia seed passes through a camel, yeah, uh, it, uh, the germination rate is increased. And so this led actually to recommendations to um, yeah, use more uh, or walk um, with the camels through these vadis uh, when, there's, when there are these acacia seeds around um, and let them eat the seeds. Um, so to increase the germination rate and actually happened, this was implemented and apparently it also worked. Yeah. So this is actually a very nice little success story for, for modeling. Yeah, and there we are already at the one of the last steps. Actually, it's never a last step because actually it's a modeling circle. So you would usually then now start, okay, germination rate is what is important. So let's have a look what um, are the factors that influence germination rate, do a new model on uh, no, an extended model um, and continue. Yeah, so actually it's never finished. <laughs> okay, that was my first example. Um, and that was, just to show you these different steps in uh, ecological modeling. Now the second and third example are very brief, uh, just give, to give you a glimpse what, um, of the variety and diversity of ecological modeling. Second example is about temperate forests. And of course, yeah, here we now um, have a slightly more 
challenging this um, situation because we have usually more than one species. Sometimes we also only have a pure stand, but um, for sure, even if it's a pure stand, the tree cover is denser than in the desert. And the typical question would be how to manage this. No? So probably some of you are interested also in silvicultural questions. And here also individual-based models are quite common, actually individual-based growth models. And maybe some of you have heard of um, the model SORTI. Yeah, that's quite a classic from many years ago. And I think it's been used still. But and from uh, and SORTI is from the US. Um, and Silva and Bewin Po are actually from Germany. But there are many, many more. I, I didn't mention, I think, more than 20 or so. Um, and there, but there's also one <laughs> a little one from, from our group, which is actually based on the silver model. And this is just to illustrate for you that something like this is possible in the course of a three-month bachelor thesis, if you, are, if you like uh, this uh, approach. Yeah? So Matthias Fritsch um, did this as a bachelor thesis. Um, and his model um, yeah, covered growth, rejuvenation to a certain degree, mortality and competition in a pure beach forest. Yeah, so this was just um, pure beach. And the big question that his model wanted to answer is how different initial spatial distribution of distributions of trees, how they actually develop um, over time. How does the um, spatial distribution change? Does it get more regular or more aggregated? Um, and how does the density change over time? Yeah, so you see here the three different possible um, yeah, spatial uh, distributions. So, um, and then we had another bachelor student who actually extended this model, and that was Ferdinand Schirmeister. And here you also see um, both of them worked with the modeling platform uh, NetLogo. I'll give you the link later um, because it's very nice for self learners. And uh, there you also have the option to uh, create such 3D uh, visualization with very, very easy tools. So it's, it's, it's all there. And you, can even, you could even fly into this and um, have a look in there, which you can use then for, um, for actual vi visual debugging. So you can ask a forest expert or so who, would, who you would send into this uh, little forest and tell them um, or ask them, okay, tell me, is this realistic or not? Um, what Ferdinand added here to the original Zimbeach model is the um, a more complex rejuvenation process and also a process for frost damage. Yeah, frost damage um, is uh, the little red dots, that's uh, trees that have had frost damage at some point in their life and are obviously a bit smaller than the others. Yeah, this, is, uh, this was just my little quick example um, on uh, how our temperate forests could be modeled in a very simple project. And the next third example is about tropical forests. Um, do we have someone? For, yeah, we do have someone from the Philippines, so that sounds tropical. Uh, do we have more people from tropical areas here around? Maybe type your country if there's anybody. Ah, Bangladesh, great. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, so there, especially um, Azarul and uh, Simon will, will know that the high species richness and Anna also will, will know that this is a particular challenge in also studying these forests, even if you don't model. Um, and the solution of modelers is to group spe similar species into groups. Yeah, and here I've brought you um, an example, which is actually has not, ha has not been developed in our group, but by um, Andreas Huth uh, from the U of Z Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig, which is also in Germany. It's called Formind, but it's such a nice example. And one of his postdocs actually worked in our group later, and I'll show you slides from her. And so that's why I, um, I'm ha very happy to cite and show you his um, their work. Yeah. And uh, so this is Formind, and here you see Claudia Dieslich, that's the postdoc who then worked in our group and who did this analysis. And if you now focus on the simulation uh, visualization, you see different colors. So we look at the plot of tropical forests and all the green colors are trees that belong to the pioneers, to the fast growing plant functional types. So PFT stands for plant functional type. The warm colors, yellow and orange and red are for the climax species like the slower growing types. Blue is intermediate growing types, plant functional types. 
And um, this is inspired by data from Ecuador, actually. And if we now look at uh, the top right, you see that the simulations um, always start with very few um, individuals um, with very little basal area at time zero. Yeah, so you see here the basal area over time. And uh, you see the, the colored dots on the, at the end of the timeline, that's the field data. Yeah, so that was actually measured in the field in Ecuador. And you see that even though they're in the beginning, the different um, basal areas of the different plant functional types and even though that didn't really fit with the field data, it approaches um, it very nicely at the end. So um, for the basal area, and also if you look at the plot on the bottom right, uh, for biomass, um, you see same over time and also the field data, it approaches very nicely and, and it works very nicely. Um, it, it shows that this model is structurally realistic. So how can you now use such a model? You can use that um, for example, for cases um, which you don't really want to explore um, yourself, yeah, um, as I mentioned in the very beginning when we talked about experiments. In this case, this was landslides, because I think those um, people here who come from an area, or if you've be, ever been in a tropical uh, forest, you know the primary rainforests are only actually mostly only exist um, still on the on the slopes. Uh, where the heavy machinery cannot reach. And the problem of the slopes is that, um, uh, that, the, that landslides can happen there. Yeah? And you really don't want to do an experiment with a landslide or so in person there. So it's very nice if you can do that uh, experiment here in this model. And this is what Claudia actually did. Yeah? I show you a different visualization here. So she um, simulated a landslide um, you see here now uh, the landslide is happening, the uh, trees are uh, all gone. And you see in the plot on the, at the top, the biomass over time. And you see the three different uh, big groups. Now the green is the pioneer species, blue intermediate, red climax. And you can follow how after the landslide, the different biomass proportions build up again. But you see also even after 80 years, they don't fully build up. Yeah, and this is, uh, just exemplary to, to show you an example um, how you can use such models to explore how long, for example, it takes after landslide to build up again. Yeah, so much about my three examples. Uh, now just um, very few ideas on how to do it yourself if you wanted to do some own modeling. And um, my first um, advice is um, the one that I already mentioned before, um, just check out NetLogo. Um, the nice thing is it's free, it's a free software. It's relatively easy to develop own models. You can ask Johanna and Simone if they agree. I hope they do. <laughs> Maybe ask them when I'm not there so they can speak freely. Um, they did that in, in classes. And it's actually, I think it's ideal for modeling novices because it's always, you, you see everything what you do and the code looks almost like an English text. Yeah, you can just download it within five minutes or so. And then there are nice tutorials for self learners. I um, recommend tutorial number three, um, but one and two are also fine. And um, if you need a bit more input, we also offer here in Göttingen um, every year a free NetLogo course. Um, uh, which is uh, the, the next one is about to start next week. Mm. So this is something, but you can also do that on your own. They are also excellent books, yeah. And what you see here is an example, again, from a master thesis from our group, that's by Bastian Hess. And that's a Rattan model. And even without actually running the model or without showing you the code, you can, um, I can explain you the basic principle. You have a little village here. Um, with, uh, and the little arrows are persons that are spreading out into the forest. Um, the shades of green are the amount of rattan in that uh, place of the forest. And so the persons move out to collect the rattan. And then you can do all sorts of um, economic and ecological analyses here. Yeah, so this is um, NetLogo. My second recommendation is if, if, if you want to go even deeper, and uh, do want to go for master studies, then I want to uh, yeah, do some PR for our new master forest and ecosystem science where Johanna and Simona are also part of. And we have three study folk, Kai there, and one is the ecosystem analysis and modeling where I'm the coordinator and you can ask me anything about it if you're interested. It's a lot of 
modeling, programming, and analytical thinking, statistical data analysis. We do a lot of R, but uh, we also cover topics, general topics such as climate change, land use change, biodiversity threats. I saw biodiversity as a topic also in the chat. So um, just check out our web um, information if you're interested or spread that to your friends if you know someone who's, who might be interested. We are really happy to have you here. Yeah. And uh, I think my last um, recommendation or second last is um, to join the Young Modelers in Ecology. Young is, is self-defined, yeah? So young can be a bachelor student or can be a PhD student. Maybe there are even young postdocs there. So whatever, whenever you consider yourself young, just um, join them. They have a job mailing list. They have one workshop per year, which is open to everybody. And you can ask them questions about modeling. They're experts for, for almost every language. So it's, it's actually a really nice uh, group of people. Um, just check them out if you're interested in that. And my last recommendation would be um, if you don't really want to do the modeling yourself, but um, would like to have uh, contact with modelers or modeling, then just ask, um, uh, yeah, people, uh, ask modelers, like us, for example, come to me and I can also um, spread the word uh, to, to find a good collaborator for your project or supervisor, if, uh, depending on where you are. Yeah. And with that, I actually would like to thank you for coming with me on this journey to virtual forests and how to understand them with models. And I'm very happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for the presentation. I think it was really, really nice and interesting, especially really at the beginning to understand why we're using models, which I guess is like the most important part to really understand which are the limitations and which are the potential of models. Um, yeah, we say we can have a question time now and feel free to either raise your hand if you want to ask your question or to write in the chat. And also to ask any question freely. I mean, like, I think we can also take this a uh, discussion moment with that question. Okay, I see one question in the chat. Um, trees which grow faster are trees which are durable at the sun in the model. You mean the, the savanna, the desert model, right? Um, uh, no, no, you mean the tropical forest model, the, the plant functional type of the faster growing trees. Yeah, okay. Um, no, it's really, oh, actually, I don't know if this is correlated with durability um, at the sun. I'm actually not sure. I think not necessarily. So it's really simply faster, more, more. I think height growth, it's height growth. It might be correlated, but I don't know if this is true for all those species they lumped into this category in that uh, model. Yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> Ah, okay, yeah. I'm also happy to, to take questions on this. Um, I go first for the chat and then for Alexa, okay. And um, so how is it possible for students from other courses to join the ecosystem modeling course? Um, so the, the, um, the course I was talking about when I talked about NetLogo, which is a block class of one week, that's completely free to everybody. You just have to be fast when, when we open registration because we have 20 places and half of them are, are um, for Göttingen students no? because Göttingen pays me, um, but um, the other half are for anybody. Even You don't even have to be a student actually. Um, so this it's called agent-based modeling with NetLogo. And if you go to our website, um, you can, uh, and you find the website behind the QR code on my slide, um, then there's something called teaching and there you find this agent-based modeling with um, NetLogo. And usually around April or so every year, we open the registration for, and the classes then somewhere in September usually. Um, and 
the, our normal classes like which are during the term time every week. Um, actually not at the moment due to Corona, obviously we, we did a lot online and next um, term we will do, a, I will do a lot in hybrid. So there might be even then the possibility to join um, as an online student. I'm not sure if you can get credits for that then, but if it's really mainly out of your personal interest, this, this should be possible, just write me an email. Yeah, and then we can talk, talk about that, how to make that happen. Okay, I think Alexa had the next question. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm currently from Copenhagen here, uh, from the Sufonama, and I'm very glad that I found the link and I had to join a little later, so I'm very sorry. Um, but I just came from another session about ecological sustainability, where we talked about Bayesian belief networks. And I just I was just wondering whether you've heard of those and uh, how do you think or to what extent those might be interesting for modeling um, in the forest field as well? And my second question would be, to what extent would you uh, use those results from the models you have shown to um, integrate them maybe in other models that interact with other terrestrial ecosystems. So having like more systemic models that, yeah, that incorporate other other ecosystems as well to have like a more complex and yeah, systemic understanding of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Bayesian belief networks belief, right? Um, I, I'm familiar with Bayesian networks um, in general. I'm not sure about the belief uh, in the middle, but. Um, I, I think they are very useful if you want to make decisions, so for decision support systems. So there they are really, and, and they are used there already. I'm not sure about examples in, in forest sciences, but they have, in essence, for, forestry is, is um, very much driven also by management and silviculture. I think they are very valuable there. I'm just not the person to, to ask for doing them, but um, I think that's actually a very good point. Um, and for forestry to try to apply that there. And uh, the other question was for the big system approach. Yeah, um, yeah um, the thing, it's, it's this thing about modeling. Yeah, I think it comes down to this simplification issue. When should you simplify um, and when should you get, make the model bigger and bigger? No? The first impulse is to make it always bigger and more complex to, to mimic reality better and to include more and more systems. So there I would always say, be a bit cautious and, and, and rather try to um, answer questions that are manageable that you, that you can actually manage with your model. Having said that, um, I think some of the models that are there now are so good and so well understood that you can start integrating them and, and linking them to other models. Now for sure, I mean, what's been done already is of course, linking them with uh, climate models, no? global climate models and, ask, and letting them drive the forest models. This is fairly obvious, but you were more thinking about other ecosystems, right? Yeah, so so maybe some, some grassland system or so and to really model a whole landscape or so. Um, this being done, this is being done in the, I think, also in management contexts no, for, for so agroforestry or so in this um, area, this is already, I mean, there you need uh, all these two different worlds or two different landscapes to integrate them. Um, so uh, there are agroforestry models. In our group, we are also working in um, the uh, and then project modeling in oil palm landscape, um, tropical oil palm landscape. It's the efforts project, huge project with many empirical researchers and us as the modeling group. And um, there we have oil palms, um, rubber plantations, primary or secondary rainforests, and some something in between, I think. And so this kind of landscape and, and finding out which mosaic of the landscape you need to, to maybe get a win-win situation between ecology and economy, this is being done now. No? But I, I think our model is just now starting to really produce these overall res result, and it's, it's still a small system, yeah, if we are honest. Um, and it took us, I think, 10 years or almost nine years, eight, eight, nine years or so. No? So it's, it's, you need to have a lot of funding and, not, no? and men, um, men and women power to, to, to go to this, to this whole systems approach. Yeah. And as I said, I would, I mean, I think it's possible we can start doing this now, but I think 
um, there's still so much not understood in, in the actual forest um, system. Take any system that you are interested in also, um, that uh, there's still a lot of space for, for stick, staying in your system and understanding that better. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. We have here, um, I see here Antoni's question. The roots are important for trees which are growing in the desert. Mm, yes. Um, actually, this is this is also what um, there's one particular process which is um, uh, how you say which, which only happens in drier ecosystems, savannas and deserts. That's hydraulic lift. Yeah, and this is something that can only be done if you have a very deep root and can reach the very deep uh, soil layers where some water might be stored, even though the top layers are um, dried out. And so they, in the night, they they take up they there's there's some physiological me mechanism to take up the water through this, these long roots, uh, and then they actually don't use it for themselves to to tra for transpiration or so, but they they put it into they they. How you say exuded uh, to the topsoil layer so that during the day they have um, th their their little roots there at the top um, have some some water and are not dried out and this is something where where actually other plants and also other trees nearby benefit yeah so this can be a facilitation mechanism there's actually a really really interesting thing about the roots in the deserts but not much is known so I did my PhD in a South African savanna and um, there we actually try to excavate root systems to understand them better and see whether it's really one big root or several and how long, how, how what, what's the radius and so on. It was uh, really difficult and in the literature was literature there was nothing. Yeah? So, but they are important, yes. Then we have something from Christian. Is this course recommended more for MSc or bachelor students? Um, so the block course, this agent-based modeling with uh, NetLogo, it's, I mean, we, we announce it more for master students, but that has more, uh, and PhD and students, but that has more formal reasons here in, at the University in Göttingen. Um, it's actually, we don't assume any previous knowledge in modeling, just an interest to learn. And you, yeah, it's quite intense classes. So it's, it's from nine to six um, for every day. And it's very intense, a lot of thinking because actually most of the modeling I'm not sure if this became clear today, but most of the modeling happens before you open or start your computer. Yeah, it's happened. The conceptual part is what, what's really where the science is. And so this is very intense. Um, so if you are willing to do that, then you don't even have to have a bachelor. And I'm happy to take high school uh, kids. Yeah, so this is, and I think next week I also have someone um, who's uh, like a, a retired person who has never seen a university or so who's just interested. So it's, it's possible. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, if anyone has a super, has a last minute question. <laughs> 